everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today to give our lovely host a little introduction. Uh, my name is Hannah, and I'm a third year student at U of C in Natural Science. And with me today is Justice and Lyndon. Justice, you want to give yourself a little introduction? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Justice Otto. I am a graduate from the University of Alberta, um, and I have a Bachelor of Commerce. I majored in finance and minored in economics. And I've been with SFC for a, about a year and a half now. And my name is Lyndon Brenner. I am a recent graduate of the University of Lethbridge where I got my degree in history. I've been with SFC for the last two and a half years. And um, yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much. Um, and I mentioned this the last couple of weeks, but we are currently going through a name change. So we are shifting from SFC to YCR, which stands for Young Canadians for Resources. Um, so with that being said, welcome back to YCR's Food for Thought series. For those of you who are just seeing YCR for the first time, we are an advocacy group made by students and young professionals for students and young professionals. And we believe that Canada can have a strong future in resources, the economy and the environment. Please connect with us on social media at any time to learn more about what we do. Joining us today is Larkin Muscroft. Larkin is a scientist, outdoorsy, nature enthusiast, and educator. Larkin's career in nuclear started as an environmental remediation specialist at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, where she is currently a senior project manager for science and technology. Her passion for a better planet, including issues of climate change and sustainability, is what drives her in her work. Through her time at CNL, she has learned voraciously about nuclear and has become a strong nuclear advocate. She's particularly interested in the opportunities for nuclear hybrid energy systems and the role nuclear science and technology can play in creating a better future. Being actively engaged in community and in school outreach, she was left with many questions about how to improve energy literacy, which led her to becoming a PhD student studying energy policy. So just before I hand the floor over to Larkin, please know that attendees are encouraged to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box below, and we'll address all of these at the end of the session. Thank you so much for joining us today, Larkin. I will let you go ahead and share your screen, um, but so appreciate having you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here, and hopefully my screen is good now. Can you confirm? Looks yeah. good. Awesome. Okay, so um, I'm really excited to be here to talk about nuclear in Canada now and into the future because of the um, impact that nuclear has had over Canada's history, especially over the last 70 years, but also because of the resources that Canada has that make it unique in terms of uh, the nuclear future. So thank you very much for having me. Um, this actually, this picture here is a picture of Canadian nuclear laboratories. It was known as Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, but is currently now Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, although our government body is still Atomic Energy of Canada. So it's a, it's a really great site to work. As you can see, it's right on the Ottawa River, and I'm calling in from the traditional territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, and so I would like to just uh, to recognize that as well. <clears throat> so where exactly is nuclear in Canada today and what does that landscape look like? Well, Ontario has a major fleet and a lot of those um, reactors are undergoing refurbishment. You can see in this middle picture that we have Pickering A, Pickering B, as well as Darlington units. Those are all here in Ontario and Bruce A and Bruce B. Bruce, the Bruce site is actually the largest nuclear generating site in the entire world. And so that is something to be very proud of here in Canada. All of these reactors are can-do reactors. We also have a can-do unit out in New Brunswick and that is Point Le Pro. But this actually, this figure actually shows how nuclear was developed here in Canada, starting with NRX and NRU, which is our research reactors that are actually at the Chalk River site, all the way up to our first demonstration plant, and then through to the larger units that you see. Um, we have units, CANDU units all throughout the world, and these CANDU can technology is now owned by SNC-Lavalin. These fleets are un undergoing refurbishment so that they continue to have good, solid life over the next 30 years. Canada is also working on an SMR action plan, allowing us to have small modular reactors, which I'll talk a little bit about later, and how we can have those deployed across Canada and how Canada can play a major role in this type of development. 
Canada is also the world's largest, second largest producer of uranium behind Kazakhstan, with about 13% of global production in 2018. Since 28, like about between 2010 and 2020, on average, you're looking at between 10 and 15% of global production from Canada. The nuclear industry is supported by a world-class regulator here in Canada called the Na New Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, and they are involved with uh, global types of regulatory lessons learned and safety learning as well. Medical isotopes are produced by Canadian reactors and used worldwide. Currently, they're produced at Darlington and Bruce Power. Although here at Chalk River, we produced one of the med uh, several medical isotopes for decades. Um, we no longer do as our last reactor was closed in 2018. CNL is also advancing medical isotope research along with partners um, across Canada to allow us to produce new types of medical isotopes. So let's talk a little bit about nuclear resources. Uranium is the resource that is used to produce to power our reacting our reactor fleets. Um, so uranium is usually either low enriched uranium, natural uranium, or high enriched. Any enrichment process requires an enrichment facility. But Canada is unique in the fact that our uranium is produced, and it's actually the largest producer, as I said, second largest producer, but the highest quality grade. In fact. Our uranium mining sites are located where there's 10 to 100 times higher quality than there is anywhere else in the world. So we have a very large deposit, but it's more importantly, it's very high quality uranium. You can see that most of that is actually in northern Saskatchewan, where Key Lake, MacArthur River, those types of projects are really well known for uranium mining. And those uranium mines are operated by Cameco. Now, you can also see that. There are some uranium refineries, so Blind River, as well as Port Hope, were areas where uranium was refined and fuel is manufactured. And then in the yellow, you can see where some of our other plants are. In terms of export, nearly 85% of Canada's uranium is exported on a yearly basis. I know this figure is a little bit old, but it seems to track around the same. And we use about 15% of Canada's uranium production here in Canada to, to power those reactors that I talked about. Now, the Athabasca Basin over in Saskatchewan is actually where that huge deposit is. So that those are kind of the two main centers. <clears throat> I've been talking a lot about, uh, in just in general and in the world, there's been a lot of talk about this nuclear revival. And that's because the areas of the world who have been able to decarbonize their electricity grid have done it one of two ways. Either you have a lot of water, which is the case here in Canada with about 60% of our energy, all our electricity all coming from hydro plants, but also the way we can do it is through nuclear. You can see here that several countries were able to decarbonize using hydro. So look at Norway or Brazil. But you can also note the countries such as Sweden and Switzerland, as well as Finland, that have kind of a split between water and nuclear. Now, Ontario is a really special case because we have one of the cleanest electricity grids in the world because of 60% of our electricity coming from nuclear. Now, if you don't have water, it means you need nuclear in order to decarbonize. Now, you might be wondering why I have Greta Thunberg on this slide. Because for years, she was anti-nuclear. But actually, just over the last month, she said that it would be foolish to close down an operating nuclear facility meaning that she is also starting to understand that in order to decarbonize that deep decarbonization, we will need to have nuclear power. But nuclear is more than just those big reactors that we all know. Those large conventional reactors of 700 megawatts electric, those types of reactors involve big capital, big investment, large spaces. And those large reactors are what most people think of. For example, there was just a 1500 megawatt reactor built in Finland. It's a large reactor, it was behind schedule and over budget. This unit here you can see is actually Bruce Power. So that's the Bruce nuclear generating station. Doesn't look like a bad place to work. Now the small modular reactors are those new types of reactors that we're talking about. And those small modular reactors are anything less than 300 megawatts electric. These types of reactors will take up less space 
you can see in this image of a proposal from X Energy, but you can also, or New Scale, you can also see that these types of reactors will have less capital, um, will be smaller overall for generation, but then they also can be used in places that have less of a large grid requirement. So that's where they can really become in handy. And then finally, those micro reactors. These are less than 10 megawatt electric reactors, and some of them might refer to them as the nuclear battery. What's really great about these is they're less than 10 megawatts. They can be hauled on the back of a truck. Similarly to the small modular reactor, the idea is that these can be manufactured, or at least major components could be manufactured, such as the core, in a warehouse or um, a factory, and then shipped to the areas where they're needed. Why a microreactor offers so many opportunities for Canada is because of our north. So SMRs or microreactors known as MMRs are a huge opportunity for Canada to decarbonize. We can use them in our north where we currently use diesel generation, where we can provide a core that's operating for 20 years without refueling. They'll grow, they'll allow us to get into the market of production of SMRs with our really strong supply chain here in Ontario, as well as the rest of Canada, um, having supported the can-do fleet for the last 60 years. We have um, also an ability to decarbonize those oil sands and our mining operations. Again, generally those oil sands and mining operations are in areas without access to the grid electricity, relying then heavily on uh, diesel generators. Those diesel generators are also an opportunity to decarbonize using a micro reactor. We can replace coal and in fact places across Canada that are considered um, considering SMRs very seriously are places like Saskatchewan and Alberta as well as of course Ontario and New Brunswick. They, those four parties have signed on to a memorandum of understanding in order to see how SMRs could be used. We can also allow the, we can also do a lot more with SMRs. They're not just an electricity producer, they can produce ther thermal energy, so heat, and they can also produce um, steam, process heat, industrial heat, not just heat for your home or your facilities, as well as hydrogen. And hydrogen is an opportunity for Canada because of the fact that it is able to store large amounts of energy over long periods of time and isn't impacted by temperature fluctuations. I was actually in a Tesla down in Michigan recently, and I asked, how does your battery fare when it starts to get colder? And as we all know, batteries are not as good in cold weather. So Canada has some other challenges that hydrogen might be able to substitute. So as I said, there's three main streams for these small modular reactors. They can be on grid, so they can be in large city centers, or advanced reactors. And advanced reactors are actually not just our standard type of reactors, such as a light water reactor or a can-do reactor, but these allow us to use different materials and allow us to look at using waste from, old, uh, from current reactors as the fuel for our advanced reactors, and then off-grid, putting them off into the north or remote locations. So CNL has a vision to serve Canada and the world as a global hub for nuclear research and technology. <clears throat> Nuclear is more than just energy. I focused a lot about that, but that's not only the focus at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. We focus on the fact that nuclear can contribute to health, well being, climate, industry, and innovation, as well as zero hunger and life below and on land. The future of medicine is something that is a big deal for CNL as we build on our legacy of Molly 99 production as well as Cobalt 60. On the left hand side of this, you can see the PET scan that's showing metastatic cancer. This scan would have been done through injection of a molybdenum 99 or technetium is the isotope that's used. And then going through the PET CT allows to show where cancer is in the body. Cobalt 60 would then have been used to kind of treat that cancer through traditional radiation therapy. But here at CNL, as well as around the world, we're looking at alpha therapy. Alpha therapy involves actinium-225, also known as the rarest drug in the, on the planet or in the earth. And actinium-225 actually can then combine with a targeting molecule that kind of acts like a key. 
It finds the exact place in the body where it's supposed to go, and it targets that cancer cell directly. So this is the future of medicine, and this is part of the research that we are doing here at CNL. Hybrid energy, so creating that smart electrical grid. Over on the right-hand side is our HASO model, which stands for Hybrid Energy System Optimization. It's something I'm involved in a lot. Um, and it takes all the different types of energy and energy storage. So storage, energy generation, transmission, and combines them to see what is the most effective way of having a cleaner grid, targeting both economics and greenhouse gas reduction. So this is allowing us to then model on an hourly basis, where traditional models are on a daily basis, what types of energy you'll need. On the bottom left-hand side, you'll see our idea for the future. This is the Cedar Park, which is our clean energy demonstration uh, park. And what this is showing is how you can integrate solar, wind, hydrogen, as well as nuclear to combine and look at the impacts on, say, greenhouses or aquaculture and how you can use those resources collectively. Because in the future, that smarter electricity grid will rely on more than just those traditional large generating stations. I mentioned briefly about advanced nuclear, and I'm really happy that we're joining together remotely today because I normally draw, draw these schematics on a board. But that molten salt reactor is actually what made me fall in love with nuclear because it's so simple. So this molten salt reactor is uh, just a schematic, but it produces uh, energy just like any other thermal plant. The molten fuel is actually say something like molten lead or uh, similar metal that is molten and then has fuel mixed in with it and then control rods can also be used. Now that molten fuel creates heat, that heat exchanger takes that steam out and then has a steam turbine, just like any other type of thermal generator. But what's super cool about the molten salt reactor is that freeze valve in the bottom. Basically says if it gets outside of its operating condition, it will actually dump the entire system, stopping the reaction, and is known as walk away safe, meaning that this reactor actually has passive safety systems for operation. So molten salt is what made me fall in love with nuclear, even though it's called advanced nuclear. At CNL, we were doing research on molten salts as early as the 50s. Over on the left is the pebble bed reactor. These pebbles are actually just core um, pebbles or balls of fuel that are about this big. They can fit in your palm. And these types are also called melt proof. And it's because of the materials that is getting used, those advanced materials, in order for the the fuel not to be able to melt down. So again, a exciting advancement in nuclear technology, allowing to kind of address some of those major concerns. And then on the right side, I would normally ask if anyone knows what it is, that's a tokamak. Tokamaks are used for fusion. And of course, fusion is one of those Rube Goldberg type situations where everyone's really excited because it could be an endless supply with very little um, nuclear waste associated with it. But there's so much more than uh, I could cover in this short talk. So I would encourage you to come check out CNL. We do have open houses uh, once in a while, and you can actually walk onto our site and see our new facilities. Um, you can learn about Chalk River Laboratories as well as just nuclear in general. We have a monthly podcast and we have a YouTube channel. You could follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. I think there's Instagram too but we post things about what we're doing and how, how we're doing it and how you can get involved. So I think if someone's interested in energy, if you're interested in climate, it's a really important and great way to get involved in, in being successful in the future for climate change. So that is all I have for slides, but I'm happy to take questions. Oh my gosh, well, I personally think that nuclear is super cool. So um, listening to some of the technologies that you guys have is really fascinating. Um, and I kind of wanted to touch on that uh, lots of people still have this kind of misconception about safety standards with nuclear. Um, so hearing about uh, the preventative measures that is just automatically built into the infrastructure now is really, really fascinating. Um, and with that being know, said, it doesn't one of, like, uh, sorry, sorry, one of the interesting ahead. parts about that is even our current reactor fleets 
I think it's really important for people to know that they're quite complicated because we have a defense in depth, which means that we put a bunch of different types of barriers between a possible hazard and an injury or an event happening. So for example, we have not only engineered controls, which are of course those safety systems, but we have administrative controls, supervisory controls that kind of help to prevent those types of incidents from happening. It's important to know that over the lifetime of nuclear, only three major accidents have happened. Most of people know them, but they're Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima most recently. And that's over 17,000 operating reactor years. So it's pretty, pretty good metrics on that one. As a nuclear scientist working at a nuclear facility, I have a lower chance of incident to myself than teachers do. So my um, risk is 0.4 um, and a teacher is at 1.2. So I will take being a nuclear scientist any day. <laughs> that certainly puts things into perspective. 